Um, yeah, uh, so I, well, um, hello again, everyone. <laughs> I just I just spoke an, an hour ago. I realized I didn't actually introduce myself. So my name is Martin. Um, I work for a company called Edis Research, um, and I also I'm also involved in the Green Radio project. And today I will be talking about GRFEC. And you know, as a as a German living abroad, I'm trying to get to grips with this concept of humor. So I try and come up with um, with a funny title. But um, actually, if I do this talk again, I will call it "Shocking Tales of Redundancies." <laughs> it's an even better title. If you don't if you don't get if you don't understand why, you you might at the end of my talk. Um, I just I just love this picture too. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about GRFEC. Um, first, before I go into this, so GRFEC is about forward error correction. This is a part of a commu every communication um, link. However, it's a very, very dense topic. So this is something where typically you would have like two semesters worth of classes just on the theory. But I actually also want to show you how to use it in Green Radio in 20 minutes. So um, I'm going to have to sort of gloss over things very quickly and really uh, this is designed for people who don't actually know a lot about GRFEC or people who don't know how to use it in Gnu Radio. But I just want to sort of tease, tease the topic for you. I don't want to actually give you the introduction because I just don't have the time to do that. <coughs> okay, so let's start at the beginning. So one of my personal heroes, um, Claude Shannon, um, came up with most of information theory in the 1940s. So I, I think, like, I, I personally... Uh, like as a, you know, as a, as a scientist, like I, I, I look up to him for various reasons. Um, you know, he was very smart. Obviously, he was not um, fixated on theory or practice. He could he could do both. Like he was, you know, he built computers and whatnot. Like he built like this. The, one of the, the things that people might have seen is like this mach machine learning little mouse that goes through a labyrinth. It's like it's crazy. Like. Um, but the, w I think the most inter interesting contribution is like this whole concept of information theory. So, like in the I don't know, before he started working, I could have asked you like how much how much information fits on this whiteboard, and people would have said what what, I, what are you talking about? It makes no the question makes no sense. And not only did Shannon come up with with the framework to understand and answer that question, he also came up with fundamental um, things like theories that are still valid today and have not and they will never go away they will they will remain and the most in important one is the so-called Shannon limit the Shannon theorem which states that um, given basically a signal to noise ratio and a bandwidth like there's a certain amount of data you can carry across that channel and um, but the interesting thing about this, he did this first. This was like basically the first thing in digital communication. He just, he just laid the entire groundwork. And he said, now everyone else can go figure out how to actually do that. That's, <laughs> and it, but I mean, that is amazing. That, that is like, even, I, I find even more um, amazing than doing it the other way around. So, um, yeah, if you if, so this is like the one single equation. I, I left all the other equations out of this, out of this uh uh, presentation very simple to understand so you know p plus n over n you can also change it to one plus p over n so p over n being your snr if your snr is zero in linear so minus infinity db which means you don't get anything across this term becomes zero so obviously you can't transmit anything if it if the db snr is zero db equals to one you have one plus one equals two log two of two is one which means your channel rate is equal to the bandwidth so you have one megahertz you get one megabit very simple and it's true. And it's not like this is not, never going to change. Am amazing. So, um, oh yeah, quick, uh, quick interlude. So I have some GRC examples. I, 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 at the end, like my final version, I have exactly one GRC example, which is not already in GNU Radio, and I will upload it to the FOSSIM website afterwards. But disclaimer, I used main 3.7 for this branch. So we are currently working on GNU Radio 3.8. It still has too many bugs for me to actually run this stuff. So uh, there's a feature called bus ports, which is currently broken. Um, I'm sorry? The point is, GRC files don't have a, uh, I am not quite sure if they have a version detection field. So if you try and run this with uh, master branch, it won't work. All right. So here's, um, I'm not good at computer graphics. Uh, so this is how I make pictures. Um, this is just a very, very like hypothetical setup. So we have a transmit antenna, receive antenna. I use the number 10 a lot because in DB that 
that works out. Um, I have a transmit gain of 10 dB, a receive gain of 10 dB, a noise figure of 10 dB, 10 kilometers distance, um, and like these are all like very even numbers. Um, I transmit. I use free space equations to just estimate my receive power. Um, really, the, the, the precise numbers don't don't really matter. The the point is I'm going to exclude all um, effects other than thermal noise, which is a very very strong um, assumption. Like you typically you do worse than that. Um, then I say okay, like I put in like sort of the basic like first year electrical engineering equations, and I find that I have a thermal noise of minus one or three dBm, and then approximately ten dB above that I have my noise power. And I'm going to do some other simplifications which aren't quite accurate. But hey, I've already graduated, so <laughs> people can't uh, people can't take that away from me. Turns out that that the that the equation earlier states we should be able to achieve about three megabits worth of um, of bit rate with an arbitrarily low error rate. And I thought, I'm like, okay, you know, arbitrarily low. Okay, I want one bit error in like 10 billion years. Like, can we do that? So wait, wait, wait a minute. Um, oh yeah, uncoded.grc is here. So this is like stripped. Everything that is um, this is super super like uh, um, simplified. There is no synchronization here. There's not even a channel. Basically, I'm just creating BPSK symbols, and I do that because I can equate SNR and EB over N zero, um, and add some noise, and then I then I um, turn them back to bits, and then I measure the bit error rate. So, and what you care about. Which for some reason is failing me right now. So the bit error rate is, is actually zero, and that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> so this number should be higher than that. It should be about um, 10 to the minus 6 or minus 4 or something like that. Like this is what I get for doing demos. Um, oh, I was playing around with the amplitude. Yeah, I'm just going to crank it up for now. Um, where's my slider? Oh, man. This is like the simplest possible. I'm just gonna change this to some other random number. Whoops, that's a bit much. Ah, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is, I'm gonna add some noise, um, and you will see. It. I mean, I kind of gave it. A I assume no one else would expect that. If you um, let me just stop that for a sec and then zoom in. So I have like plus one, minus one symbols, but I've added so much noise that it looks like this, and then. Um, like a whole bunch of these bits come out wrong. Okay, so um, now I, I fudged the, 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 the noise amplitude just now, so I don't actually have that SNR that I mentioned earlier. But if I had the SNR, it would, it would still be like that. So um, if, if Shannon says, well, I can transmit like a, a whole bunch of bits, at like three megabits, like without error, and I'm transmitting one megabit with errors, like what am I doing wrong? And the answer is, <laughs> well, my guess my transceiver is not sufficiently complicated because that's the beauty of the original paper by Shannon. He says a sufficiently complicated encoding system <laughs> will achieve that. Now you go find out that what that encoding system. What's my time? <clears throat> now if you look at this um, setup that I used, um, like I'm transmitting plus one, minus one bits, but I add noise, so I actually get this probability distribution of received symbols. And as soon as they sort of move over here. I will interpret the plus one symbol as a minus one symbol, which is a bit error. This here is something I can actually trivially calculate for simple schemes like mine, using like the error function, like the Gaussian error function. So I can actually predict accurately my bit error rate. But that doesn't help me because I wanted to transmit without any bit errors, um, and that's where we need forward error correction. And what forward error correction does in a nutshell is it adds redundancy. Now this is where, like the next two slides, is where I skip over two semesters of classes in, in one minute. So there's no way I can actually sort of um, relay the, um, the full information of it. But consider this case here. I want to transmit four bits, one, one, zero, one. And you might say, OK, well, I'm going to just put them onto plus minus one symbol. So I can, you know, this could be on a wire, or um, this could be over the air through some other kind of modulation. So here's my bits, one, one, zero, one. Four bits, but like, who says that I have to do that? Like, no one. Like, I can do whatever I want, as long as my receiver knows how I 
um, ch like put this into some physically rep physical representation, I could do this. One zero one zero one zero one zero one. And um, you'd say, well, wait a minute, that makes no sense. Like this bit sequence is not in in, in this bit sequence. And I said, so what? Like. I'm making up my encoder here. So like as long as my receiver knows that one zero one zero one zero one zero equals one zero one one zero one, I'm done. Um, and you say, okay, well, fine. So what do we have here? First of all, like I said, we don't have the original bits in this code word, which is not necessary. Like a lot of forward error correction codes actually do keep the original bits, but it's not a requirement. But what's more interesting is that I have more bits now. <laughs> And um, I have to transmit them in the same amount of time if I want to sort of like not change my actual setup, which, which ha has some interesting um, implications. Because if I just transmit these slower, then I might also you know, keep the original one, transmit that a bit slower, which means I have a little bit more power. And that will also increase my bit error rate. So this is where it gets really, really difficult. And this is where I'm just going to have to jump over it and say, you have to come up with this, this encoding such that sending more bits in the same amount of time, which re increases the bit error rate of the individual symbol, is still better than doing this. And that's what um, people have, uh, you know, many PhD theses have been written on this topic. <clears throat> There's a couple of words that you, w that you I just want to say the words out loud, so you've heard them once. If you know forward error correction, then this makes sense. Otherwise, just keep the sort of, like basically say, ah, oh, yeah, okay, I heard it in Martin's talk. I don't know what it means, but it doesn't matter. So if we, we talk about a systematic code. If the uncoded data is included in the encoding, um, encoding increases latency. It's a problem. We have to deal with it somehow. Um, we, can, we can have multiple codes, and we can combine them, and then we, that we could typically you know, we call that concatenation. Um, we, um, like I said earlier, you have to have a code that is better with more shorter bits than the other, than the uncoded one. And if it is better, then we, we say we have a coding gain. And um, this is this is a, also a concept that I need like two or three slides, and I think you'd get it. But I'm just going <laughs> to skip over that. Puncturing is an interesting uh, feature that we can employ. You know, when we add redundancy, we send more bits. So, but I can just I can just also leave some of those bits out again. So we first add bits, we take out other bits. Why, does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense because it, it allows us to um, change the, the rate at which we encode. Just like I said, this is just a word that I wanted you to have heard. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. So um, how, like, like, you would think like someone can fig figure out the way to do forward error correction, but that is not correct because all applications are different. Consider a satellite talking to a ground station. Like there is nothing between the satellite and the ground station. This is a point-to-point -point link. Like, I mean, sure, maybe like a plane or something will fly through the, the beam briefly, but it's not a big deal. The only thing that matters is that the satellite is moving around a little bit, like relative, if it's like a geosatellite, for example, if it's like any other satellite, it'll move around a lot, um, which means like the distance here changes, so we have changes in our SNR. Um, but they are usually predictable. So if we want to have a code for this kind of link, it'll be different than what a CD player does. So if you consider a CD player, like you have a scratch on a CD, that means like all of these bits are fine, and then like poof, like a whole bunch of bits are gone. And then you continue here with like good bits. Like this is a different kind of error that you obviously need a different kind of code to um, uh, work out and then mobile phones have like the worst constraints of all like literally everything matters in a mobile phone We have bad SNR typically you have Doppler shifts you have all kinds of like channels that look like this But also people want to watch YouTube immediately and they want to be on the phone So they have to do everything quickly. So this is where it gets really interesting And these are just a couple of other names of codes that you should have heard before so um, if you if you go to school and learn about codes, often they, like the first code they talk about are Hamming codes. They're not really that relevant in, in mobile communications. And convolutional codes, which are used a lot, like Wi-Fi, for example. Turbo codes and polar codes are just names of codes that are used in wireless communications. And then there's a whole bunch of other codes. Um, you can see like people have thought about this a lot. All right, what's more time? OK, so this was, this was basically the theory. Thank you. <clears throat> this was the theory. Except I left out all the theory. 
um, but we have mod most of this in GNU Radio in a modular fashion, which is useful because you don't actually have to understand all of the theory. And trust me, most people who do work in wireless communications don't understand all of the theory. Not because they're lazy, it's just a lot of stuff to put inside your head. And if you're building like a point-to-point -point wireless communication link, like you have so many things to worry about, like understanding every little nuance of the equations of um, forward error correction is, is a lot to ask. So that is also true for equalizers, synchronizers, etc., which we all have in GNU Radio. So GRFEC fits well into that category. Okay, so you build GNU Radio, you make sure that GRFEC is enabled. There's usually no reason to disable it. And, um, and then you have FEC blocks available. And it also has a bunch of examples, and I will show some of those. So the first example that I want to show you is called FEC API decoders.grc, and it is actually part of the source tree. Uh, this is squashed up a little bit, unfortunately. Even on the new HD screens, we don't have that much space available. I'll try and, I'll try and um, uh, untangle it a little bit. So what do we do here? This is effectively the same example that I showed you earlier, except we don't have any noise anymore. And what we do is we generate bits in this block, and then we send them to the receiver on four different paths. And like I said, this is just an example. This is not actually a, um, like a, a useful communication link. So we take bits, we encode them, we turn them into BPSK symbols, like this was the plus one, minus one representations of our bits. Um, and then we decode those, and then we just look at the, the result. And we have three different codes here. So, um, and you will notice that the block is always the same, even though we have different, different codes. So let me just run this real quick. It's not um, the most enlightening um, like visualization here, but it is just nice to see that um, things are obviously working out. So the random, oopsie, oh, sorry about that. The, uh, the random bits that I'm generating um, are coming out identically in all four cases. You can see I have my, my uncoded bits and I have a thing called a dummy encoder, a repetition encoder, and a convolutional encoder. And it's um, maybe not obvious, but basically this is just like the representation of the bits and they're all the same. So, so that's why you can only see one line here, which is black. Which means our encoding decoding is doing something correctly. But the key concept that I wanted to show you with this example is not like the, uh, the visualization, rather it's like how the encoders are set up. So like I said, we have bits generated here and they go into this block called the FEC extended encoder. If you look at its parameters, it has this thing called an encoder object here. And um, if I scroll down a little bit, I have different encoder definitions. So I have a CCSDS encoder, a dummy encoder, I'll talk about that in a sec, and a repetition encoder. And all the code specific details are hidden away in that block. So I'll open this for a sec and I'll, you'll see there's like a frame size, a streaming behavior. These are all parameters that other codes don't necessarily have. Um, and then there's an, like a, there's an uh, um, equivalent decoder object um, that has you know, a bunch of other settings. But um, the thing to keep in mind is we have these guys here. These are the actual encoders. And these are the blocks that capture those encoders and actually run them. So the uh, distinction that we make here is blocks versus kernels. I need to hurry up a little bit. So yeah, we have this guy. It's the block. And then you pull in the encoder. And this thing we call a kernel. And these are exchangeable, and you can uh, reload your own and, and write them very quickly, and you don't have to worry about GNU Radio as much, which makes it easy to integrate it with other libraries and our SIMD extensions. So there's three types of blocks. Actually, there's six types of blocks, and every block has an extended and a non-extended version. And the extended version, for all, like for everyone who's starting, is the only one that you need, because it's the one that adds like a whole bunch of sugar and like adds like some Python to make it easier to use. And then really you just have to ask yourself, do you want like sort of this continuous streaming model? Then you use this guy. Are you using async messages? Then you use this guy. Or, or are you using tag stream blocks, which are um, streams with boundaries? Then you use this block. But you could pull in the same kernel in all cases. Um, so as you can tell by the signatures here, the purple versus the orange, 
the encoder takes actual bits and outputs actual bits, and then you modulate, whereas the decoder takes um, soft bits. So this is a floating point representation um, of your bit that includes uncertainty. So um, if you were, so we, we differentiate between soft and hard decision decoding, but like no one does hard decision decoding. Uh, and in a soft decision decoder, you don't just give it a plus one or a minus one or a one or a zero. Rather, you give it a spectrum of values where the um, absolute value sort of determines your certainty. You can also give it a zero, which is neither a plus one or a minus one, to indicate that you have no idea what the bit should have been, and then the decoder can handle that. The other options that are interesting are the threading model. If you have lots of stuff going on and you have plenty of cores, there might be some um, process optimizations that you can get. And puncturing is handled by the blocks and not by the kernels, because that's an identical process. The available kernels that we have are, um, I mentioned these guys, Polar and Turbo codes, LDPC codes. So these three codes are important for um, wireless communications. Um, so Polar codes will be uh, um, in 5G new radio, Turbo codes um, and LDPC, sorry, LDPC codes and Polar codes are in 5G new radio. Turbo codes are used in LTE, for example, convolutional codes in Wi-Fi and in uh, GSM. The dummy encoder is actually not an encoder. It's more of a debugging block. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, and the repetition <laughs> encoder is an encoder that is often comes up in like classes where you, the, the, what you do in a rep repetition encoder is you send the bit multiple times. Turns out that's actually not very useful. Um, and I'll show you why in a sec. So now, uh, my first example was very, very brief. Um, there's another one that I picked out as a um, more useful example, which is the polar encoder. So um, the polar encoder, once again, has a comparison between what happens when you encode and when you don't encode. So the right-hand side is what I showed earlier. It's the exact same thing. I have like noise and bits, and I don't do anything smart, and I end up with bit errors, 10 to the minus 3. So every, um, every thousandth bit is wrong. Whereas if I add polar encoding and decoding, it's fine. Why is that? Because Shannon says it's fine um, within the parameters that I set, and polar codes actually achieve the Shannon rate at sufficiently long block lengths. That means long latency, but it also means no bit errors. Yes. OK, um, eventually, even the polar codes give out if I, you know, I can, I think, yeah, there we go. Um, eventually, they, they also start having bit errors, and that's because my block lengths aren't actually that long. And maybe I'm also leaving the Shannon limit. But I have much more space to work with. Um, yeah, the, the flow graph is pretty much the same as before. So I'm just going to hurry up because I'm running out of time here. Um, the other thing that you can do with GNU Radio is uh, BER simulations, but it's questionable whether or not that is actually the right tool to do that. Um, the way you do that is a little bit different than you would in your typical scripted application, because what it'll do is it'll run all of these at, in, at once and then sort of continuously update this. Why is this useful? Well, because GNU Radio is a, sort of a continuous streaming model, and you would really only use this to... Um, basically test the, the various encoders versus one another. Now, I also want to caution people to interpret this correctly. Um, I thought this is interesting that we have it in our tree because it's a little bit of a dangerous graph. Why is that? The um, lowest bit error rate is related to the convolutional coder, so LDPC and turbo codes are worse. And also we have like this red line versus this blue line. Like This kind of doesn't make sense. Like Something is not correct. Like How on earth can I transmit more data if I repeat bits. And how, why is this better than this? Reason is I'm not actually comparing apples to apples here. Um, in the red case, I'm actually transmitting less data, like one third the amount of data per, per second. And the same is true for the rest. I haven't basically um, corrected for the different um, rates that I've achieved. So, okay, like I said, running out of time. Um, so this is basically more of a debugging tool. If you want to do a theoretical research, I, like this is one of the rare cases where I would probably not recommend in radio. But the fact that our kernels are separate from our block model means you can still share code very easily. Oh, no, okay, that was the example I just wanted to show you. Um, 
And before I conclude, I just wanted to name a couple of people that worked very hard on this. Um, so Nick McCarthy, I think, came up with the original FEC API. Uh, Tim was probably involved. Um, but then there's a couple of people who contributed like the like really relevant codes. Johannes, um, Manu, and Tracy were actually um, GSOC students. Um, and Johannes spoke about his codes, his Polar Codes implementation, GICON 16. This is a link to the actual talk. There was another talk to, um, about Polar Codes at the same conference, but they were not upstreamed into GRFEC. Okay, so um, some redundancy is good, some is bad. FEC is definitely of the good variety. Um, I like the uh, modular approach. It fits very well into GUNA Radio. We do need help, um, you know, making sure those... And we have a lot of really good codes in there, but we can always incre increase their speed. That's something that is very difficult. And um, as sort of new wireless protocols, um, you know, appear in the wild, we also need more, you know, different types of encoders anyway. So, yeah, I hope people consider um, taking a look at GRFEC, and, you know, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.